This is Jose David Cantu, or otherwise known as JD, uh, from Hispanic News Online. And we are continuing our 30 for 30 podcast series. And I'm going to force through this because this is going to work. This young lady that I just met, Vanessa, is amazing. Um, we have been scouring the country for new leaders, people that are doing good things. We are particularly looking for those people who don't have a lot of PR machine behind them but are doing really good stuff. And one of the reasons we'll be picking some of these people is because – not only because they don't have a PR machine behind them. It's because they're doing the work, this extra work, on their own a lot of times. And that means that – that makes them a leader in my book. If you do something more than you're supposed to and it's positive for the community, that makes a leader for me. So with that, I want to introduce you guys to Vanessa Rivera Colon. She is uh, working in the medical field. And that's one of the subjects I wanted to bring on and cover during this podcast series about some of the Latinos and Hispanics who are working in the medical field. Um, she is working as manager for outreach for wellness, education, and resources. Vanessa, ¿cómo estás? And I am so sorry for all the problems we're having, but <laughs> please introduce yourself to our friends and on the airwaves and uh, let them get to know you. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you so much. We, um, JD, I think this is a tremendous project that you're doing, um, 30 days and interviewing Latinos throughout um, the United States to share these stories that oftentimes we don't get to hear these stories. So I'm doing great. Um, you know, I am excited to have this opportunity to speak with you today and share some of the things that we're doing over here as well. Yeah, t Vanessa, you know what? We had a little conversation the other day, and you gave me a little bit of your background history. Would you mind sharing that with our folks and telling them you know, where you came from, your, a little bit about your family history and stuff? Yeah, definitely. So um, I actually I was born in Puerto Rico, and um, I, t I see that sometimes there's a trend that a lot of us come from our countries around the age of six. So my family decided to come to North Carolina at the time. Um, my father had an opportunity over there. And um, you can only imagine being Puerto Rican in North Carolina in the 80s, not to age myself, but um, it was just different, a completely different environment. Um, I do have family in Puerto Rico that lives in um, rural environments, and then, of course, we have the city, but North Carolina at that time was not extremely diverse, um, but our parents were very much involved in civil rights, and they still are to this day, and when at that young age, they would have us um, connect to the local church who used to provide a lot of outreach services to the migrant communities in North Carolina because tobacco was a big, big field um, out there, as it still is. And um, we, my parents would provide um, pro bono legal services or just volunteer in the community. And it really opened um, my eyes to some of the struggle that um, the Latino community has, and specifically the migrant farm worker community. Um, you know, so I'm very grateful to them for instilling that in us that we have to give back, that um, having those roots, regardless, here we are, Puerto Ricans working with the Mexican community. It's not just um, in the clicks of, I only work with this community or that. It's those that, that need our service and the Latino community overall. So um, I did end up going to uh, Penn State. I wanted, um, I lived some time in Florida and then we moved. Um, we tend to move a lot. We went back to Puerto Rico for a period of time. And um, I went to Penn State and got my bachelor's and my master's there, um, my master's in education in um, community health. And it's really been um, my passion, my whole career really, community health, um, just advocacy for those that need the support in the community. I was also fortunate during those years um, to work for AmeriCorps um, when I was younger in New Mexico, and that gave me exposure to the Pueblo Indian populations, to um, people who were of Spanish and Mexican descent. So um, I just love that, the diversity within our different communities. So. For about seven years now, I've been working as the outreach manager here at Moffitt Cancer Center, and our focus is really to reduce cancer health disparities. Um, so what we have, the good news is for Latinos, as far as 
cancer, we tend to get less cancer, we tend to die less often from cancer, but what we're finding is that people are coming in at later stages. So um, while we're getting it less often, they're coming in at later stages, and you know what that means, that means survivorship is not as um well, your well, outcomes aren't as good. Okay. So 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 generally the numbers are that the Latinos have less cancer and you know, probability of getting cancer. But the yeah. problem is that that could even even go even lower if people really got involved and, and understood that if they got screenings and stuff and went and saw a doctor and got tested for stuff, that they would probably even be able to combat it before or or at least get ahead that, of it right is that, that what you're saying that is exactly it that is exactly what i'm saying so what we're finding is that you know we started looking and we're like what are these barriers that people are facing why are they coming in at later stages because later stages means survivorship is going to drop dramatically so in looking at the research, looking at different communities, people are saying, okay, we don't understand our doctor. There's nobody that speaks our language, specific to the Latino community, or there's somebody that's not culturally competent. So I, they don't understand my culture and the nuances of my culture. So imagine they're telling me, well, you need to go get a mammography screening, but in my country of origin, we never had mammograms, you know, so um, those are some of the barriers. Transportation is a huge barrier in our community. Um, if people live in the urban communities, um, they tend to have a little bit more access or a lot more access to transportation, but our rural communities tend to have very limited. And then Sometimes there just there aren't doctors that will accept the insurance or doctors accessible to them. Also, the the other piece that we see is that um, somebody may come in for a screening, let's say a mammogram, and the radiologist tells them, okay, you have an abnormal. Now you have to come back in six months. Well, that six months turns into one year, <laughs> turns into two years, and then we get them in one of our classes, and they're telling us, oh, the doctor told me to come back five years ago. So that's another piece that um, in our community, yes, early detection, we want to go in there at the recommended ages, but we need to follow up. It's very important because if we follow up and they find something early, they can do something about it. The later, the more we wait, that's where we really start looking at challenges. So, um, so tell me, ahead. so, okay, if we have some Latinas out there listening to this, what is the, mm -hmm. what is the, the suggested time that they should first start getting tested and screened? What, I mean, what, at what age should they start going in? So um, I can go down the screening recommendations for both Latinas, the Latinos, men okay. and women. That'd be great. And, um, so the, the typical age that they recommend is at age 40 to get your mammography screening unless there's a family history. So if you have somebody in the family, you want to talk to the doctor and see if maybe you need to come in a little bit earlier. If there's any symptoms like a, a mass, a lump um, under the armpit, by the breast area, any leaking, anything unusual in the breast, it doesn't mean it's cancer, but they should probably go to the doctor, make sure they do a clinical breast exam, and sometimes they'll recommend coming in a little bit earlier. Pero, pero, like, let me tell you, like my mom, sure. I'm going to tell you, yeah. I'm going to break in real quick. Mm -hmm. Pero, like my mom, you know, she's old school, no, no, <laughs> to take her to the uh -huh. doctor is like, you know, like, she's a Pulling teeth. Yeah, oh my God, una mula. I, that's what we say. She's like a mule about that, porque una mula. No quiere ir, nunca quiere ir, but, you know. So, sure. and, and también, you know, the embarrassment, you know, there's a little bit of embarrassment mm -hmm. that, that they're used, that, you know, they don't like having, you know, the visual and stuff, you know. What, what do you, I mean, okay, so tell me about it and, and tell the Latinas, especially in, in a little bit in Spanish, because you speak Spanish, I know that. And so, yeah. mm -hmm. si, si, si comienzan primero, that, what was the mm -hmm. age you told me again? At, at 40. At 40. And then mm -hmm. what about young girls? Do, do you recommend young girls coming in and getting, you know, for ovarian and all that other stuff i mean is that still at 40 or is it or unless unless they have history i mean como so younger the younger women um they can um as well as older women they can do their breast self exam so they're gonna um look in the mirror see if there are any changes um any um puckering of the skin any nipple inverted um so they they want to do that on a monthly basis until they're 40. again if there's an abnormality they definitely want to talk to the doctor about coming in earlier and that's for the mammogram um what i recommend like for your mom's case because we 
run into all sorts. Uh, yo y en este programa que estoy, estoy, eso duele, es terrible. Yeah. No, I'm not buying it. Um, if you've had a child, <laughs> there's quite, quite a lot of, um, you know, you know that that is a process and it's funny because sometimes we hear people say it's like giving birth no it's not i'm telling you the truth and and um your listeners you know do not believe the myths out there in the community um it should be something you know it it doesn't it, it's a little discomfort but it's nothing uncomfortable and what we suggest to women is if you are scared bring your comadre bring your your sister your friend to go with you to the mammogram um most of your techs that do your um, mammograms are women because I know a lot of times our community, they prefer, you know, being providing um, that service, having a woman provide it to them. And then, um, you know, just really have that network of somebody, you know, so you could do like a buddy system, like we're both going to schedule a mammogram and I'll go in with you and then you go in with me. You know, so those are things that we can do because it is cancer is painful, you know, it, it's not like, you know, oh, yeah, I'm going to wait till I have symptoms. When we have symptoms, it's usually later in the stages, and that's what we want to avoid. We want to be preventative, and um, that's why I started a program um, in 2011 called Yo Me Cuido. Um, we kept hearing, like, young women in the community were dying from cervical cancer, and that recommendation is you should start at age 21 for your pap screening. We were hearing young women in the community stage 4, which is a later stage of breast cancer, and I was like, what on earth is happening? We have to do something about this. So I have a great team. They're outreach workers, health educators, and, you know, I sat down and designed the program based on recommendations, all the science behind it, like what's going to work to get women. And um, since 2011, they have educated 4,000 women. They've seen, um, provided free mammograms to close to 600 women in the community here in Tampa. And just, you know, we help them overcome the barriers. So our staff, they speak Spanish. We, um, we navigate them. We explain the process to them because sometimes it's like the first time they had a mammogram and they're like, oh, my gosh, I heard this is this, you know. So we really we're there to support them, hold their hand. And then the next year, our goal is now that we helped you through the process, you are empowered to go and get your screening. So we started that program, and in 2013, we actually went to the White House. <laughs> so we were really excited because um, one of our outreach workers, she was recognized as a champion of change by the White House for the work that she does with Jim McQueen. And to us, you know, it's I love seeing, you know, women take charge of their health. And in particular, we called it the Jim McQueen because for Latinas, you know, a lot of times we're taking care of the house, we're taking care of the, the spouse, the significant other, um, and it's like, okay, well, I don't have time to take care of myself. And right. our message is you must take care of yourself first to be able to take care of the household and the job and the husband and the children. And it really resounds with our community. We're, I mean, we have women who, they work in the fields all day long, they're tired, but they're coming out, or women in the city that, you know, are busy all day long. Right. Um, and they're coming out to get their screenings. And to me, that's, it's so powerful to see that transition from a couple of years ago where women are like, no, we don't really talk about that. No, no this is not something that we do to, okay, I'm ready to get my screening. And it's just, um, it's a wonderful feeling to see um, women being empowered. And it's interesting, we work um, with different communities, and some of them don't even speak Spanish. They speak um, indigenous languages. You know, So people are like, oh, this is a Mexican population in, in Tampa, but um, they speak Mixteco, you know, and Spanish right. might be their second language. So I think it's just, for us, it's understanding the culture, being culturally competent, understanding what the barriers are, and then helping people because we also help men overcome some of those barriers as well. Speaking of men, let's let's go there porque yes. that's that's <laughs> yeah. probably even probably a harder you know market to get into is the the yeah the men because of the machismo and you know están trabajando todo el tiempo. I mean they're they're working yeah, yeah. you know they got to feed their family so they don't want to get off you know I I had an old friend who we couldn't get him to go to the doctor even though he had you knew that he had asthma and he was a mm -hmm. painter and he wouldn't wear a mask, you know? And so, oh, yeah. you know, the son cabezones, cabezones, they don't want to go listen. Yeah. They don't want to do it they, because they don't want to miss work and no quieren estar, you know? So how, how do you deal with that? 
So um, we use the power of influence. Um, usually the partners are very influential in that. Um, so we educate a lot of the women in the community, but um, we also have sessions. Actually last week our team went out and collaborated with um, the different companies that pick, um, I believe they're picking potatoes um, this this particular month and um, worked with the crew leaders and the men came and they were educated about healthy lifestyles and the screening recommendations and the men were engaged they were interested because it applied to them and they were speaking directly to them um, it is hard because a lot of times you know people are working all different types of hours so um, what we've done here, it is once a year, but it's been very um, successful. We host uh, a forum called the Men's Health Forum where it's our 16th year. We advertise to all the men in the community and we say anybody who's uninsured or underinsured, this is your one-stop opportunity and we collaborate with 80 different agencies and the men come in, they can get HIV testing, hepatitis, SPIs, they get vision, hearing, they get BMI, blood pressure, glucose, cholesterol and we have guys that use that as their opportunity to basically get a physical once a year. Um, we do it on a Saturday when um, awesome. Most, awesome. most of the men are off. But um, and some men they tell us, okay, I need to come in. I have two hours, and the beauty of it is that within less than an hour you can get three exams because we have so many people volunteering. So that's been a very effective method. We have free breakfast, free lunch, uh, all the goodies. We educate them. Um, we have social services, so legal services is there. Um, the Affordable Care Act, so it's a one-stop opportunity because we know people are busy. And traditionally, unfortunately, men are not going on a regular basis for their physicals or for their prevention um, screening. So we're, we provide free transportation. We partner with the um, local transportation um, the heart line here and they provide us free bus passes so it's really um, our community coming together for the health of the men and um, we just had tremendous success and the men are always like que Dios lo bendiga. you know thank you right, so much right. and we have men from all different walk we have three different languages we have um, Creole because we have a Haitian community here we have English and Spanish and we make sure that our volunteers speak different languages to make sure you know to guide the men to the different areas so um, what about the what about the well yeah. <laughs> millennials the the young men who are yeah. are second generation or um are educated here in the US uh would you give them can you give them a, a schedule when they should go start you know getting screened for you know tests for cancer Definitely um so millennials um are young guys you want we always talk about risk reduction. So healthy eating, no smoking, and that could be hookahs, e-cigs, lo que sea, none of that. That is just not, it's, it's poisoning the body. Um, exercising. So these are ways to reduce your risk. Um, consuming more vegetables, more fruits, reducing your red meats and pork. I hate to break it to everybody, is a red meat. <laughs> so these are the important things that women and men can do. Um, as far as the screenings, um, and this is for women and men, colon cancer screening at age 50 is the recommendation, again, unless there's family history. Prostate screening is a little bit controversial lately, so um, they really are staying away from like age requirements, but what they say is to have the conversation with your doctor, that if you have an uncle or a father or a brother that has prostate cancer, you want to be able to um, talk to the doctor and see if you should probably come a little bit earlier for that particular screening. And then for men and women, skin skin checks. That's, is, that's is, oh one my of, gosh. I'm getting to that one next. Yeah, I wanted to know about that because, you know, are, yeah. are there, están trabajando afuera todo el tiempo, you know? You know, they're and seen, you know, they don't use, you know, sunscreen very seldom. Do I know yes. that they use sunscreen? Uh, so can you, can you tell Let me, me tell you the biggest myth in our community, because some of us are a little bit darker than others, that we don't need sunblock. I'm here to tell you that is a myth. And um, what happens a lot is people don't use sunblock. And then they're caught at later stages because they're thinking, oh, I can't get skin cancer because I may be a little bit dark, darker skin. We have to use um, the, it's called broad spectrum um, sunscreen, the SPF 30, and you want to put it on half an hour before you go outside. So you want to use like a shot glass full, 
um, to cover yourself and then reapply every two hours. So it's not just oh, un poquito, a little bit here and there. You really have to cover the body, cover the ears. If your feet are exposed, you need to cover your um, feet, your arms. Anything that's exposed, you have to cover. Um, also, wearing a wide brim hat, not just you know a cap, but a wide brim hat will cover some of your neck. Um, longer sleeves that people can tolerate it because it covers the arms. Um, so all of this is really important. And unfortunately, we see people, I've had wonderful discussions with relatives who say, no, I don't need this, or I want a tan, or I want, you know, um, I remember the days where I had relatives who would go out in the sun with baby oil, that oh. it, that's just burning your skin. So we need to start these healthy trends within our community, SPF 30 or higher, um, SPF 30 should be fine, and then applying, you know, half an hour before, and then every two hours reapplying. Well, you you guys have some great programs going on there. I mean, yeah. you guys are you guys are really working with the community. That's really really nice. And and is I mean, I guess the hospitals are way behind you guys and and really kind of pushing this also. Yeah. So that's that's really our focus. Um, the hospital says, you know, we really need to get the message out to the community, people that are not receiving the messages, and do it in a culturally competent way. So we go out to the people. We never work nine to five. It's, you know, on Saturdays in the evening, um, whenever anybody needs us, we're out there. And, you know, we educate all different kinds of groups. Like I said, farm workers, we have seniors, we have urban communities, church groups, um, newly arrived um, refugees. We do provide those services. And then when I'm outside of the hospital, I also, um, because seeing the need in the community, um, I did create a program called the Padrinos de la Salud that helps Whoa, 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 <laughs> hold on, back up again. You're yeah. going way too fast. So you do that not nine to five, but whenever it, it has to happen, you know? Uh, and yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying you're probably working more than 40 hours a week. And, and yeah, the, that's right. <laughs> and then you went ahead and did what? So I created a program um, called the Godparents of Health, and um, it, I was just, I saw the gaps. We have a lot of partners in the community. So we have like 200 different agencies that we call partners, and I kept hearing stories of people who did not have insurance, and they were in, in bad situations. You know, they needed um, ostomy bags for a surgery, or they needed a catheter or a wheelchair because they were just released from the hospital, but the hospital didn't provide a wheelchair and they had no mobility. So um, as I kept hearing these stories, I was like, I have to do something about it. You know, it's, it's in my heart and it's something that, you know, I feel like it's my responsibility to do something. And because I know of different resources in the community. So um, it's a very informal group of friends and family that I always harass. But when one of our um, community partners will tell me, okay, Vanessa, there is a child who has a brain injury and they need um, help into getting therapy or, um, you know, there's a man in the community who needs a catheter because he's quadriplegic. So what I do is put the call out to friends and family and say, hey, you want to donate or, hey, do you know of local resources? And we then um, provide that to them. We've been able to provide food for a family that had newly arrived and um, clothing for a baby. We, like I mentioned, ostomy bags, the wheelchairs. Um, we were able to get our young lady with the brain injury an iPad to help her communicate and also develop some of her cognitive abilities. So, yeah, I do that, you know, <laughs> after hours um, on my oh free time. My but God. I think it's very important. And I know there are people throughout the nation that do this and, um, you know, I, I just think if we don't do it, who is going to do it? And it's just advocating for those that may, may not have that voice and we have that voice. Well, hold on, hold on. So you're Latina, right? Yes, Puerto Rican. Rican. Okay, well, I just, I, hey, well, well <laughs> I just wanted to make sure because, you know, with Donald Trump and a lot of people out there saying that we're nothing but <laughs> drug dealers. And, and here you are, a Latina in the U.S., mm -hmm. going out – doing your job on a nine-to-five basis, you know, or long yeah. more, and yet you go out and create another program to actually help your community. You know what? This is what I'm, this is what I'm talking about, people. We have people like Vanessa out there. Oh, my God, Vanessa. I mean, your community is so lucky to have you. 
I, I can't imagine. Thank you. You know, not having somebody like you that could help my aunt or my tia or my my primo mm-hmm. or my prima out there. I, my my hats out to you. I, when I heard your story, I was like, I got to get her on. This is this is impo- this is amazing. This is amazing stuff. Oye, mija, let me let me ask you this: Are are you guys extending this program mm-hmm. to or throughout the country? I mean, are you guys getting together with other hospitals or what about if another hospital and somebody in another region of the country is thinking about they want to do something like this? Could they reach out to you guys and maybe you guys could help them extend this and maybe do it in their community? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my doors are always open. Um, it, and as far as our cancer education, our goal is really, you know, we started educating throughout the state of Florida um, with webinars and doing kind of a train the trainer. So we are more than happy happy to share our model, what that looks like, educating the Latino community and underserved communities because it's not always exclusive to Latinos. I'm open to that. And then our my side my side project, Got Parents of Health, definitely collaborating with other groups and seeing what resources are out there that could benefit the community. Completely um, I'm open to all of that. Well how can people reach you? Uh, can you give us some, some contact information for uh, how they can possibly reach you? And I am Guys, we're giving you some great information here because these programs are needed throughout the country. If you're in South Dakota, Mississippi, Alabama, New York, Atlanta, you know there's some parts of your country of the country that just don't have this type of information. So, how, give us your contact info. Sure, my direct number is eight one three seven four five four three zero six. And then they can email me at my home email, and I'm old school, so I'm going to say how old school I am. The email is eslradio at aol.com, so that I heard, you know, I'm not hip enough with the Gmail yet. So, um, And then they can always visit the website for Moffitt, where I work. It's www.moffitt, which is M-O-F-F-I-T-T dot O-R-G. Vanessa, you're amazing. I can't, I can't. Um, she's going to send me all this information, guys, and I'm going to put it on the blog so that you guys can read under the blog. I put some information about Vanessa there, her biography and stuff, and you can find where you can reach her. Amigos, amigas, you know, our community needs little angels like you out there. If you have any desire, if you're in the medical field, if you are just an advocate for the community, here's someone who is going to basically help you get something started in the community for our um, workers, our gente, our primos, our familia. Um, She is willing to connect you and get you the right information and help you guys get started. So please reach out to her. Um, Vanessa, I I just, you know, I'm just floored with the stuff that you're doing. And I just am amazed that, you know, there's people with Corazón like you. So I appreciate it. And I really appreciate you coming on and talking to me. You know, at the end of these conversations, I usually give my guests um, a time to basically give give everybody a (laughs) word of advice out there. But I'm going to do the same thing to you. But I'm going to say to everybody out there, she doesn't even have to say anything. Because actions are louder than words. And the actions that this woman is doing out there and helping our community speaks for themselves. But I'm going to go ahead and let her say something anyway. But <laughs> if you gotta, you got to, you know, listen to her. Mijo, I'm blushing. <laughs> Thank you so much. But what I want to say is that when we – when we start looking at who we are as a community, I want everybody to remember who we truly are. So none of these, you know, Trumpisms as you were referring, I came from a family that was proud, a family of respect, a family that valued education, and they struggled. My abuelito started in the apple fields in New York and then ended up in a bodega and then back to Puerto Rico. But for us to remember the value of our community and that we have to give back, we're not just in isolation, it's just our family. We have to give back to our community. It's our responsibility. And to honor those things that are so special about our community, that we care about each other, that we support each other. Um, that's how I was raised, and that's how I'm raising my children. And I just encourage everybody to get involved, however little, however big, but get involved in your specific community. Oh, I couldn't have put it any better than that. 
everybody, we all have gifts. God has given us some kind of gift of making us who we are and what you know and successful in our careers and doing what we do and in love and passion that we carry around us. Please remember, sin Dios no hay nada, pero he's given us a chance and the ability to do something not only for ourselves but also to give back to our community. So take time and understand that, you know, we're all the same and uh con la bendición de, de Dios se si hace todo. So don't forget to look back and, and help your community. Vanessa, okay. I know I know you're a busy woman and you need to go. Uh, I only had 30 minutes with you. Pero mil gracias por venir y telling the people everything that you know about you know the information. I know it's a short period of time, pero the stuff that you just gave people is really important. Don't forget the ages, everybody. Go get screened. Go get looked at. Right. Uh, it's important. Let's catch it in, ahead of time because... We'll live a lot longer, and we'll be more productive for this country, and we will help this country get stronger and better. With that, everyone, I'm going to say adios, goodbye, farewell, hasta mañana. I hope that you guys come back and uh, listen to us one more time. This is, once again, J.D. Cantu from Hispanic News Online, and we are doing 30 for 30 during Hispanic Heritage Month. I hope you guys are enjoying it. And come back mañana, we'll introduce you to a new Latino or Latina. Thank you, everyone.